A while ago, someone was describing to me their summer holiday and how great it had been. The hotel was fantastic, the food was amazing, the location was not to be beaten. And I was sort of making suitably warm, kind of appreciative noises. And then they said to me, we're going back next year, would you like to join us? Well, now suddenly this got interesting. They weren't just describing a place that I was never going to go to. They were inviting me. It was an invitation to leave dull, drab London behind and go somewhere wonderful. Well, Isaiah 55 is an invitation. You can see it there in verse 1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy, eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. This is the last in a series looking at Isaiah chapters 40 to 55. And as we look through these chapters, on the one hand, we see the promises of God, promises of forgiveness, of freedom, of a great kingdom to come. And on the other hand, we see the futility of living for the idols of this world. God is so much greater than anything in this world that we might live for. And as we get to the end of this section, Isaiah issues another appeal that we would accept, we would receive, we would trust the promises of God. It's a chapter that's full of commands. Come, listen, seek, return. I worked in uh, finance for 15 years, and when we did a new pitch for business to a client, we'd get to the end, we'd summarize why they should give us our business, and then we were taught to look them in the eye and ask them for the, ask them for the money. Well, here, Isaiah looks us in the eye, and he says, are you in? I don't know what your sales pitch would be for becoming a Christian or staying a Christian. But here, Isaiah layers up his invitation in an almost breathless way. And in essence, what he says is trust God's promises because they are certain and they are abundant. Well, I've uh, put an outline on the inside of the service sheet that you might find helpful. And broadly speaking, I think Isaiah here gives us five commands. And the first is delight in God's free riches. And this is verses one to two. Where he starts is by asking us where we look for satisfaction. So look with me, please, at verse one. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy, eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Drink, eat, be filled, be satisfied. You can sense the urgency here, that repeated word. Come, everyone, come to the waters, come and buy. Maybe in that little mini heat wave last week, you went for a run or you got on the tube home. And when you got home, you were gasping for water. You could feel the back of your head tingling with the dehydration. The glass of cold water, you can feel it going right down your chest. Well, that is the image here. As we come and receive God's blessings, his forgiveness, taking us out of slavery to sin and bringing us into his kingdom. You probably know the context for Isaiah is that God's people are thirsty for blessing. They had been sinful, they had turned away from God, and God announced that they would be defeated in battle and taken into exile in Babylon, physical captivity, because spiritually they were captive to sin. And so there they are longing for freedom. Freedom from Babylon, freedom from sin, freedom for God's love, his grace, his forgiveness. Now, that is exactly what Isaiah promises, and it's like water on a hot day. You may remember back in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3, God says, I will pour water on thirsty land and streams on dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. These are the promises of these chapters. These people have turned away from God, and now God will reclaim them. He'll pour his spirit on them that they might know him. No longer will God's people shrink from him in regret and shame, but they'll actually be known as his people. What a wonderful restoration, and that is what Isaiah calls them to receive. 
it's all the more extraordinary when we think of the nature of this God. I don't know if you can think right back to the very beginning of the series, Isaiah chapter 40. Here's how God is described there. God is the one who sits above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. That is the God that Isaiah invites us to know. He is the God that he invites us to call our God in his blessing and forgiveness. The light in God's free riches. And these riches are free. You see that in verse 1. Come buy, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Who offers anything for free? How does this work? Well, in one sense, we'd have seen it a couple of weeks ago, Isaiah 53. It's God's servant who prays, pays for our sin. But for the people now, forgiveness is free. There's no turning out of the pockets, no shuffling away disappointed, no looking at the price tag and slipping out of the shop. Delight in God's free riches. Why wouldn't you? Verse 2, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy So often that is exactly what we do. We exhaust ourselves chasing after that which does not satisfy. One of the themes of these chapters is the futility of chasing after idols. For the people of Isaiah's day, that would have been images made of blocks of wood or metal. For us, it'll be the things of this world, career, approval, image, money, family. And as we chase after these things, it is exhausting. We double book ourselves all the time because we don't want to let people down and then we're running around late from one appointment to another. We stay later at the work drinks than we intended to because I might pay off, I might get into that inner circle. We hit a deadline and the high is empty so we go on looking for the next thing to achieve. It's exhausting. In chapter 44, Isaiah said, the one who lives for the things of this world feeds on ashes. Imagine getting in from the hot tube on a hot day, given a glass, and it's full of ash. You drink that. There's no satisfaction there. It's dry and parched. When I first uh, started work, I was working late one evening, and there was a guy working in the office, and he let me into the secret of his success. He said, every day I wait until everyone's gone home, and then I work one extra hour. It's that extra hour that will get me ahead. Actually, he wasn't very good at his job, so he just did things badly for an extra hour. (laughs) But the things of this world, they're not free. They come at a price. They demand a high price. That extra hour, that extra worry, that fear. Why do you labor for that which doesn't satisfy? Delight in God's free riches. I think sometimes we think that the um, Christian life is sort of cold water and bread against the rich fare of the pagan world. Isaiah says the opposite. End of verse 2. Listen diligently to me. Eat what is good. Delight yourselves in rich food. As well as water, there is wine and milk here. The image really is of a market stall owner with a table laden with good, rich fare, giving it away for free. It's penetrating stuff. What he's saying is, where are you looking for satisfaction? Where are you throwing your energy? Your own little world? Our reputation? Our achievements? Or the glory of the creator of this world? His works? His glory? That we can call our own through his forgiveness? Delight in God's free riches. But maybe we say, well, how can I be sure? So many of the things in this world look good, but they fade Why would this be any different? Well, secondly, Isaiah says, listen to God's eternal king. And this is verse three. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. We can be sure of these promises because of God's everlasting covenant. That is his promise. You remember that God made a promise, a covenant to Moses, and that was conditional. If the people get his law, they would receive blessing. 
Now, the problem of Isaiah 1 to 39 is that people didn't keep the law. That is why they're taken into exile. But there was another covenant, a promise to David of a king to come in David's line whose rule would be everlasting. And that covenant was unconditional. And that is the covenant that Isaiah speaks of here. And that is why his call is for us to listen, not to comply or to obey, because it is unconditional. It's free. Like people listening to someone reading a will, we just listen and receive the promise. And the promise is of this king to come. Verse 4, a leader and a commander. But also you'll notice a witness. Now think back to the context of Isaiah 40 to 55. What we've seen emerge through these chapters is this figure of a servant. Chapter 53, the servant brings forgiveness. He's a sacrifice who will bring sinful people back to God. Chapter 42, he brings justice like a king, a leader, a commander. Chapter 49, he's a prophet calling the nations to listen, a witness. Well, these are the ideas we've got here. A leader, a commander, a witness. What Isaiah is saying is that God's promises of this eternal king are fulfilled in the servant. That is why we can be sure. Listen to God's eternal king. And of course, we've seen what the people of Isaiah's day hadn't seen. We've seen God's eternal king in the Lord Jesus, the one born of the line of David, the one who stood up in the temple. Do you remember John 7? And he said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. The one who said, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. The one who was sacrificed for our sins and the one who rose in glory to everlasting life. This is God's king. This is why we can be sure of God's promises. They are eternal. And they're joyful. I don't know if you noticed in verse 5, the picture here is not of this king going out and imposing his kingdom, but of people running to him. Verse 5, Behold, you shall call a nation that, do not, that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you. Perhaps think of images of the Allied forces entering occupied France uh, to relieve France from the Nazi occupation. And you see people running out to meet this army. That is the picture here. People of all nations running out to meet this king. Listen to God's eternal king. So here are God's people. They're about to see Jerusalem destroyed, the walls demolished, their king captured, and the nations tearing them apart and mocking. But here is hope. As the very walls are demolished, God will build a new kingdom. As their king is taken into captivity, God promises a new king. As the nations mock them, God promises that the nations will run to this king. This is a kingdom that will last forever. So often we exhaust ourselves chasing after the things of this world that don't last. Friendships that prove fickle because people turn against us or we just lose touch with them. Workplaces where time and again someone who seems indispensable leaves and, and the world keeps going. Our family is blighted by death and by illness. We exhaust ourselves chasing after what won't last. But Jesus' glory will never end. The life that he gives is everlasting life. The forgiveness he offers, if we accept it, will never be taken away. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom, free and certain. Listen to God's eternal king. So Isaiah says, why exhaust yourselves for what doesn't satisfy, for what doesn't last, and for what is not worthy of our worship? Thirdly, Isaiah says, return to God's greater ways. Look with me, please, at verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God that he will abundantly pardon. Return to God's greater ways. Now, there are two new notes that Isaiah sounds here. The first is one of urgency. Verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. God is willing to be found. Actually, that is extraordinary. 
that when we come to God, we find not punishment, but compassion and pardon. This is more than just a return from exile. This is forgiveness. That is what God's people craved, to know that God had not deserted them. But Isaiah says, don't take that for granted. If forgiveness is on offer today, seize it. Jesus says that he'll return at the end of time to judge, and then the time for forgiveness will be over. There's an urgency here. The second note here is that to seek is to forsake. So you can see that positively, verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. Then negatively, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. To seek the Lord means to forsake what we were chasing after beforehand. And this cuts to the bone, doesn't it? Because so often we want the blessings of God without a sense that we're somehow losing control or giving up what we perceive to be our freedom. So in Isaiah's day, people would go to the temple, they'd pray to God, and then they'd go home and pray to the household idols. We want God's blessings, we want everlasting life. But in this life, we want the riches of career and approval and wealth to add Jesus to our portfolio of interests. But Isaiah says, seek and forsake all that other stuff. Why? Would you notice this little word for repeated in verse 8 and 9 and 10 and 12? He gives us a series of reasons now to seek the Lord. So first up, verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see the repeated words here, ways and thoughts. So what we're to forsake is our own ways and thoughts, because, verse 8 and 9, God's ways and thoughts are so much greater than ours. So the image is that we go out uh, this evening and we look up in the sky and we see a plane. And there it is, right up in the air. It looks teeny tiny from this distance. And yet we know that on the plane there are like normal-sized people walking around. It's that far away. Well, so God's ways and thoughts are so much greater than ours. His thoughts, his wisdom, his ways, his, his morality, his works... Our thoughts are corrupted by sin. Our lifestyles are debased by evil. But God is immeasurably higher. And such is his grace that he bridges the gap. Our ways are sordid. We take God's good gift of sex and we degrade ourselves. We take God's good gift of humor and we're cheap, we're mocking, we're unkind. Our ambitions focus on ourselves rather than the nobility that cares for others. Our thoughts are foolish. Our politicians think they can deal with selfish abuse by a new regulation or program or initiative. And we exhaust ourselves chasing after this stuff. But God's ways, as we see them in his servant, in Jesus, well, here's the one who sacrifices himself for the forgiveness of others, who let go of the riches of heaven for us. Here is the one who rules in justice and righteousness. Here is the one who speaks of wisdom that is so beautiful that if only we could live like that, well, then the world would be transformed. God says return to God's greater ways. So why exhaust yourself for what doesn't last, for what doesn't satisfy, for for what is not worthy, and for what is not certain? Fourthly, Isaiah says, trust God's certain word. And this is uh, verse 10. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Do you remember the heat wave last summer? All the grass everywhere was just yellow and dusty and, 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 and hopeless. But I guess if you went somewhere like Lord's Cricket Ground or Hampton Court Palace where the sprinklers were out, lovely green lush grass. That's what water does. Well, that's the picture here. Isaiah is writing to an agricultural economy in the Middle East. They depended on rain. When the rain came, the crops came up. So rain comes from heaven. It doesn't fail. It bears fruit. God's word comes from heaven. It doesn't fail. 
it bears fruit. It is certain and fruitful. So Isaiah says, trust God's certain word. So often we exhaust ourselves chasing after things that are uncertain. Our projects have risks. Our relationships turn sour. Our plans fail because we build them on words of exaggeration, of optimism, of half-truths. But God's word is certain. I recently started uh, following one of these management gurus on Twitter. It's great. He's got great words. He makes me feel so much better about myself, so much more in control. But after a month, I'm just beginning to realize that he can't change anything. It's this kind of common sense laced with optimism. (laughs) But God's word is certain. It does change things. His promises of this eternal king to come. And his word bears fruit. It never fails. It goes out, it calls the people to Jesus, it transforms them, and it brings forgiveness. You know, the time that we spend reading God's word, living by it, sharing it, it will be fruitful. Trust God's certain word. So why exhaust yourselves for what doesn't last, for what doesn't satisfy, for what is unworthy, for what is uncertain, and lastly, for what is no real riches? So fifthly, Isaiah says, rejoice in God's abundant freedom. Let me read from verse 12. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hand. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Rejoice in God's abundant freedom. This language of going out, is the language of liberation, of freedom. But it's more than just a physical freedom from exile. Look at the scale of this. The whole of creation is involved. I mean, let's be honest, some of this language is slightly weird, isn't it? The thing about hills singing and trees clapping their hands. It's slightly odd. But what's going on is that the whole of creation is rejoicing as God's people are led for freedom. Freedom from sin into God's kingdom. Again, think about the Allied forces entering France, and the crowds cheering on the side of the roads. Well, as God's people enter freedom, the whole of creation, the mountains and the trees are there rejoicing and transformed. The myrtle is an evergreen tree, no dead trees down the side of the road. No more thorns. Thorns are horrible things, aren't they? You hit a ball into the undergrowth, you have to put your hand in and get it, it comes out all scratched. No more. This is freedom. Spiritual freedom, forgiveness, freedom from punishment, freedom to enter God's new kingdom. Rejoice in God's abundant freedom. I say God's abundant freedom because while it's his people who are set free, it is his freedom because it is to his glory. This is the end of verse 13. It shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. People love to make signs to their glory, don't they? If you want to see Nelson's glory, go to Trafalgar Square, big pointy thing. That's his sign. Well, God's sign is the redemption of his people, that he has set his people free by Jesus' death, free from the guilt of sin, free to know him. That is what causes praise for his name. So often we exhaust ourselves chasing after things that enslave us, We're consumed by our work. We crave applause. We're addicted to achievement. We can't stop thinking about what others think. But here is freedom. The freedom that the whole of creation longs for and rejoices in. The hope of a world transformed. The glory of the one who transforms it. That the one who through the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus, we can call our Father and know ourselves to be his people. To be absorbed by his greater glory. Rejoice in God's abundant freedom. So Isaiah says, come to Jesus. Delight in his riches. Riches that are free, that are eternal, that are worthy, that are certain, that are abundant. Why would you exhaust yourself chasing after anything else? Let's pray together.
Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy, eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the free riches that you have given us in the Lord Jesus. We praise you that in him we know you, we know your forgiveness, we know all of your abundance. Please forgive us for when we look for riches elsewhere. Please would we be those who delight in him and in him alone. To his glory. Amen.